Alright, let's go on a world tour. I'll show you the most curious things internet users have found across the globe. Little things light up cultures like nothing else. Let's start in a wonderland world, Asia. First stop, India, the country that will soon surpass China and will become the most populated country in the world. This right here is a street where many training and coaching centers are located. Now, in some states of India, people still widely follow a sustainable tradition of serving meals on banana leaves. A kind Redditor shared what a typical meal looks like. Another user commented that it is also common across the world in Puerto Rico. This right here is a regular day in Sri Lanka fishing. Tic Tacs are so expensive in Sri Lanka that little packs of 8 pieces are a thing. In China, some malls have a husband's storage. Women can leave their husbands there so that the boys can enjoy video games while their wives are shopping. It spares women from a lot of whining. Now this is a McDonald's located in an old newspaper stand. Even manholes are a work of art in Asia. Here's one example, a dragon art spotted by a user in Wuxi, China. Turns out, in China, eggs are sold in mesh bags. And of course, Asia has a bunch of snacks with unusual flavors. They even have cucumber-flavored chips. This guy went to get a coffee in Singapore and got it in a bag. Turns out, it's quite common in Southeast Asia. Also, they take ice cream sandwiches there quite literally in Singapore. Thing is, they put ice cream between actual toasts. The Redditor confirms that it's weirdly delicious. Would you dare to try? Here's a first look at a city in Japan. A Redditor shared a beautiful photo made at night in Yokohama. Other internet users shared that they felt very safe there, even when walking at night. And this is a photo of a snowfall. I didn't know that in Japan they get that much snow. Turns out, many toilets there have sinks on top of them. The dirty water after you washed your hands is used to flush, which saved Japan millions of gallons of water. They also collect rainwater and then use it to wash the roads. The water in the street canal in Japan is so clean that fish swim there. In Japan, many manholes are beautifully ornated too, and several users shared some of them. These are Japanese rice fields, and this is one of the designs in their cans. A Redditor spotted a tiny house somewhere in Japan. I wish I could have had the tour. They have driverless KFC trucks roaming the street and selling you food. Turns out, the Japanese don't have signatures. Instead, each person has a personal stamp that they use to sign documents. And this is a photo of a night bus. I wish every country's public transport was this cozy and comfortable. One Redditor went to see the White Temple in Thailand. You see, the buildings there are so stunning that even the toilet looks like this. This is a mobile 7-Eleven in Thailand. In Vietnam, tour guides can row with their feet only. This Redditor has proof. And now we're off to Australia. Some buses there have special stands for the passengers' surfboards. Since we like traffic lights today, I can't but show you this one. It features Mary Poppins, and it's installed in Queensland, the hometown of P.L. Travers, the author of Mary Poppins. The next country on today's tour is New Zealand. Look at this urban wonder, a new apartment building built over an older house. Also, the citizens of New Zealand enjoy a unique lemonade drink Coca-Cola produces just for them. What a VIP treatment! Now, let's move across the Pacific Ocean to North America. We start in the second biggest country in the world, Canada. One of the most common stereotypes about Canada is that they are very polite. Well, a Redditor posted a photo of a Canadian bus saying sorry for being full. Even the buses are polite there. Another user found an outdoor toilet, but of course, dressed for cold weather. And one more user shared this photo. It was so windy in the town that the grass got blown off. As some Redditor commented, I can't own anything. The wind tried stealing my grass. One more unusual occurrence, a Redditor shared a photo of a huge iceberg passing by. Now, let's move to the US and start in the northern state, Alaska. These light pillars are reflections of the ice crystals in the sky. A resident of Alaska opened the front door after a snowstorm. 
Did you know that the U.S. is the homeland of skyscrapers? Yep, the first skyscraper in the world was built in 1885 in Chicago. The home insurance building had 10 stories. Now, it's not even close to a skyscraper, but that was the start. And look what this Redditor found in Seattle. It's not unfinished work, it's a skyscraper built on top of an 11-story pedestal called Rainier Tower. This is an abandoned diner somewhere in the California desert. Here's another interesting photo from a Redditor. A Mexican restaurant moved to a building where KFC had been. Instead of removing the logo, they just added a sombrero, a mustache, and a poncho. I say, genius! Since we talked about Mexico, let's move there. One user shared a pack of toast bread without any crusts. And another Redditor showed that potato chips go with a small packet of salsa there. Here's a Mexican crosswalk. The man on it has a dog and a hat. And this user shared photos of how his grandma hand-painted a toilet in Mexico. And this toilet brush holder gives me chills. Mexico is a whole different world. Cenotes are caused by erosion in the limestone bedrock, and they hold ground and rainwater. But this Redditor probably didn't expect to see this wonder right by a Costco store. The award for the stadium with the most mesmerizing view probably goes to this one. Turns out, the Bahamas are home to the biggest underwater statue in the world, which is called Ocean Atlas. Here's a photo from a Redditor. It's magnificent. You can even see a woman sitting on its hand for comparison. And here's a curiosity from Belize. Apparently, they sell bagged drinking water there. It's very common in Central and South America. And this user met a grasshopper in Costa Rica. The hand is for comparison. Now, I have a question. What do Costa Rica and Australia have in common? Central America is hot. The average annual temperature there is 81 degrees Fahrenheit. No wonder this taxi in Panama only has controls for cold air. Okay, let's say bye to Central America and see what South America has in store for us. And the first store is in Colombia. A Redditor shared that in Bogota, people are paid for dressing as traffic cones and shaming drivers for parking on the street, which makes them move somewhere else. Having a stroll down the stairs of Brazil doesn't seem easy. You can run into trees like this one. Asia is well known for crazy chocolate flavors, but look what this Redditor found in Brazil. Snickers bars with coconut flavors, passion fruit, and even caramel and bacon. Here's a 20 peso bill from Argentina. It has guanaco on it. We still have to move across the Atlantic and visit Europe and Africa. Let me continue my world tour, and now we're heading straight to Europe. Let's start our journey in Greece, a place with thousands of years of history. Even in modern days, there are still ancient ruins there that are being carefully preserved, and it's an interesting ride. The airport of Athens has a built-in museum with ancient artifacts. And here's how ancient and modern coexist there. Here's the view of the Acropolis from the street. A Spartan roaming the streets of Greece. A Redditor shared a photo of a modern building built right over the ancient ruins. The visitors can see the ruins through the glass. Greece is also very well known for its cats roaming the streets everywhere. This Redditor spotted a cat guarding the National Bank of Greece. These days, everyone is trying to reduce the usage of plastic. Some use paper straws and some go with glass straws. But this cafe in Greece offered to use macaroni as straws. I'm not sure if it's stupid or genius. Another user went to a restaurant in North Macedonia and got baffled when they served slices of pizza on waffles. Double win, a snack and no waste. In Romania, vending machines seem to be a thing. This one, for example, is a machine with ham. And here's a better one, a vending machine selling cartons of eggs. Scrambled eggs, probably. Europe is a place where old neighbors are modern. And this combination is mesmerizing. I'll show you. This Redditor shared a photo of a modern basketball court squeezed between 700-year-old walls in Croatia. And here's a photo from inside a grocery store. Look at these old columns. 
Modern problems require modern solutions. These traffic lights light up the ground so that people who store their phones could notice when the light changes. Italy is a work of art with thousands of years of history. I have quite a bunch of stuff for you from there. Some ruins date back thousands of years, and a lot of that gets preserved. A Redditor shared a photo of a lobby of a hotel that has a glass floor so that the ruins were visible. And these are the railing in an Airbnb. Even street signs are a work of art in Italy. Look at this one. Another Redditor shared even more designs. This Redditor showed a photo of a supermarket that is located in an old theater in Venice. Another user added one more photo of that supermarket. Since we're talking about supermarkets, apparently, pets are allowed there. There are even special carts to carry them. Cities are centuries old and there are quite a few narrow streets, so post vehicles have to adjust to fit them. Here's one of them. Some cities have canals or are located on islands, so boats are a thing. This is a UPS boat at Murano Island. Europe is packed with countries. The city of Basel in Switzerland is located right on the border with France and Germany. So the airport has three exits. You can walk out of it to France, Germany, or Switzerland. Let's walk out in Germany. Look, there's a traffic light with a girl walking a camel. The reasons are a mystery to me because camels aren't really a German thing, but it's cute. Here's another unique streetlight featuring Karl Marx, a famous German philosopher. Back to baffling vending machines. In Germany, you can find vending machines with sausages. Hamburg is Germany's major port city. There's a river that connects it to the North Sea. No wonder there's a drive through McDonald's for a boat. Look at this design of mineral water that is being sold in the Swiss Alps. A Redditor brought a souvenir from France. These are baguette-shaped pens. Look at this narrow house in Spain. I wonder what it looks like inside, but unfortunately, the Redditor only shared the exterior. In Portugal, cell phone towers are disguised as trees. And this is a bus that can ride the roads and then turn into a boat. A Redditor spotted doors in London that have doorknobs in the center. This seems super inconvenient, but apparently the handle doesn't turn and exists only to pull the door closed. And the metal part with the keyhole has a little handle on the bottom of it. Europe is a historical place. This post box bears the mark of a king ruling over a century ago. Back in the day, red telephone boxes were in high demand. Nowadays, when every person has a cell phone or two, not so much. So telephone boxes are being used in different ways. This one, for example, is now a smartphone repair shop. Luxembourg is a small but rich country squeezed between France, Germany and Belgium, and they have baguette vending machines. Let's move north first to the Netherlands. Farmers border their fields with a strip of flowers and put up a sign with a QR code where people can pay for picking the flowers. And here's just a weird installation spotted by some Redditor. In Denmark, in Aarhus, a city founded by the Vikings in the 8th century, you can find traffic lights with Vikings pictured on them. Some trash cans in Swedish subways have a separate space for cans. Homeless people can pick them up and exchange the cans for some cash. There's a giant statue of a silver moose in Norway. And these are signs on bathroom stalls depicting reindeer. Apparently, Finnish people are as polite as Canadians. On the bus, they have a button to thank the bus driver. Also, a Redditor spotted a raccoon pattern on a bus seat. We all know rocking horses. Most of you probably had one in your early days. Well, Finnish little people have rocking moose. Many people come to Iceland hoping to see the northern lights. A Redditor had a phone in the hotel which had a special button to wake the guest up when the northern lights appear. Lithuanians sometimes put fake police cars on the sides of the road to combat road speeding. Europe has been ruled by kings and queens for centuries. Even today, many countries like the UK, the Netherlands, Spain, Denmark, Belgium, and some other countries have monarchs.
So, no wonder that there are hundreds of castles scattered across Europe. Poland doesn't have any monarchs these days, but it still has 500 castles. Here's a warning sign for ghosts next to one of them. In Wrocław, all landmarks have a model so that visually impaired people could touch and see them too. There's also a statue of Darth Vader in one Polish city. In reality, it's a statue of a Polish magnate who supervised the construction of a port. But from time to time, locals dress the statue in Lord Vader's costume. This sign in Poland specifically prohibits bikes, tractors, and horses to go on a highway. In some places, there's a separate line on the sidewalk for people who are walking and staring at their phones. And now, we travel across the Atlantic to Africa. This is Dune 7 in Namibia, the seventh biggest dune in the world. It's as tall as the Empire State Building. An internet user shared this photo. Someone in Tanzania put a literal penthouse on top of the building. I did some research and found out that it's a hotel. Still doesn't explain the roof, but I'm totally buying it. Maybe it's marketing. Drivers in Mozambique should be careful and watch out for elephants. And this is a sign from South Africa. Watch out for penguins. And another one that asks to baboon-proof the trash bins. So baboons are the raccoons of South Africa. Trees growing through the roads aren't surprising anymore. But this is a palm tree in Morocco growing through multiple balconies. A Redditor shared a photo of a runaway horse in Israel returning to the backyard in an urban area. Urban horse encounters are relatively common in the country. A hotel in Turkey served a whole honeycomb for breakfast to this Redditor. In India, some people have tasty chickpea and tomato curry for breakfast. It's also accompanied by puri, deep-fried flat bread. Try to say that fast. <laughs> it's hollow in the middle and gets puffed up with steam when it's heated up. Some South Africans eat putu pap for breakfast. It's a sort of oatmeal, but it's made from maize and water. This dish can be eaten throughout the day, but if you're having it for breakfast, it's paired with milk and sugar. Sengalese coffee is nothing like a tall Americano. The powder they use to brew this drink is made from coffee beans, grains of saline pepper, and cloves. It's way spicier than the good old pumpkin spice latte and gives you way more energy. Over in Morocco, people prefer drinking mint tea. For breakfast, they grab a couple of freshly cooked flatbreads. They're layered and can be served with jam or honey, but sometimes you can find one stuffed with veggies or even meat. The chickpea soup called lablani is a typical breakfast dish in Tunisia. It can be pretty spicy thanks to all the onion, cumin, and herbs they cook it with. You might get a poached egg on the side, if you're lucky. In Nigeria and some neighboring countries, people have fried bean cakes for breakfast. The main ingredients are black-eyed peas spiced up with dried chili, fresh onions, and fresh red chili pepper. These cakes are deep-fried and are a popular street food. Korean breakfasts are usually pretty filling. They're made up of many banchan, which are basically side dishes. There's kimchi, a sort of fermented cabbage, a rolled omelet, marinated veggies, and jun, a sort of pancake. Wow! A Japanese breakfast can seem a bit more like lunch or dinner in other countries. You know, soup, rice, salmon, even pickled veggies. In Jamaica, people eat saltfish and ackee for breakfast. Ackee is an exotic fruit similar to lychee with a soft and creamy texture. One more tiny detail, it's kind of illegal in the US. It's mostly because the seeds are toxic, but you can eat the flesh safely as long as it's fully ripe. Better know the difference. Maybe the world's craziest breakfast sandwich ever comes from the Netherlands. They have sandwiches with candy sprinkles on them. Right, it's just sprinkles on top of buttered bread. Hagelslag, as it's called, means hailstorm, and it comes in various flavors – chocolate, vanilla, and fruit. A German breakfast might seem kind of heavy if you're used to just having a bowl of oatmeal. We're talking bread rolls, an assortment of cheeses and meats, and if need be, they can top it off with an egg or two. Coffee is the drink of choice to wash down this hearty meal. Oatmeal lovers head to Finland. The traditional breakfast of this wonderful country consists of oatmeal they call pu'uru. 
It's served with fresh or sometimes frozen berries, sugar, and milk. The Italian breakfast is definitely not the main meal of the day. They might grab a cornetta, which is basically a croissant, maybe with a sweet filling, and a cappuccino. By the way, Italians usually only drink cappuccinos in the morning. And if you ever order a latte in Italy, you'll get a glass of milk. What we call latte in English is a cafe latte in Italy. Muesli is enjoyed all over the world, but especially in Switzerland. A typical breakfast muesli consists of oat flakes, raisins, dried fruits, nuts, usually mixed together with yogurt. In Sweden, people eat typical breakfast sandwiches called smurgos. It's a generously buttered slice of bread with some sort of topping. It can be ham, fish, or cheese, and it usually has some cucumbers, lettuce, or tomatoes thrown on there. Many people like it with hard-boiled eggs. People in Sweden are crazy about filter coffee. It tastes so good. The French breakfast is perfect for bread lovers. They have a full range of yummy breads and buns, and yup, they got that croissant thing that most people can't pronounce right. Hey, did I nail it? Maybe put a little French honk on it. Croissant. Get yourself some plain bread and some butter and jam on top, or opt for pain au chocolat. The most common drink is coffee, but many people prefer juice instead. An Argentinian breakfast can be similar to the French one. They have pastries and coffee for breakfast too. Medjolunas, which is half moon in English, look a whole lot like croissants. They're just a bit smaller and sweeter. If you're not a fan of sweet pastries, grab a piece of toast called a tostada. And if coffee isn't your thing, just have a glass of orange juice. Yogurt, cereals, and eggs are mostly reserved for tourists. If you ever want to try a traditional Mexican breakfast, cook chilaquiles. Cut a bunch of corn tortillas into pieces and simmer them in salsa. The tortillas get a bit soft. Next, add some fixins. Avocado, soft cheese, even chicken. Put some rice and beans on the side and buen provecho. Want something lighter? Mexico has awesome pastries. There's one that's shaped like a shell, and one that looks like two ears stuck together. A Peruvian breakfast looks really exotic for those who've never been there. One of the traditional dishes is tacacho con sencina. Hope I got that right. It's basically roasted plantain with bits of pork. It's a popular type of street food, too. The two most important things for a Brazilian breakfast are bread and, mm, not exactly a toughie, coffee! The favorite kind of bread for many Brazilians is the French roll, which should be generously buttered before eating and might be followed by a few cold cuts. Tropical fruits like papaya aren't exotic at all in Brazil, so don't be surprised to see them on your table when you travel to Rio. Colombians have dozens of cool breakfast recipes. In Bogota, the capital, you can find changua, which is egg and milk soup with cilantro and stale bread softened in the broth. Another hearty dish is a calentando, made of reheated rice or bean leftovers served with sausages, avocado, and eggs. In Costa Rica, people usually eat rice and beans for breakfast too. Surprise, surprise! Unlike in Colombia, Costa Ricans grill plantains, they're like bananas but a lot less sweet, instead of sausages. Drinks are simple, coffee or juice. Getting hungry yet? One more country where rice for breakfast is super common is Malaysia. The way they make it is really cool though. It's cooked in coconut milk and served with a variety of side dishes. It can be a boiled egg, a cucumber, anchovies, or even peanuts. Eggs in the form of an omelet and cake filling, deep fried dough sticks softened in warm soy milk, twisted pancakes stuffed with veggies. If any of that sounds yummy to you, you should try a Taiwanese breakfast at least once. Wash it down with a variety of warm soy milks. There's plain or black, which is milk seasoned with sesame powder and peanuts. A Hong Kong breakfast wouldn't be complete without its very own milk tea. It's all about the technique they use to brew it. The sock-looking cloth that filters it is really thick. When the black tea finally comes out the other end, don't forget to add some evaporated milk and sugar to get that authentic creamy flavor. Now, don't get this one wrong. If you see sausages, eggs, and roasted meat for breakfast, it doesn't mean it's an English breakfast. Take a closer look. See that rice? 
sweet bacon marinated in brown sugar and soy sauce, and a cup of hot chocolate. (laughs) Welcome to the Philippines, and enjoy your meal, it's scrumptious! If you ever travel to Indonesia, don't miss your chance to try some black rice coconut milk-based porridge for breakfast. Disclaimer, it's actually not black, it's more purple. It's called, I'm gonna try this, Buber Kitan Hitam. Was I even close? This stuff is especially yummy when topped with sliced bananas and cinnamon. They also have papeda, an oatmeal thing made of sago flour. It's starchy, sticky, and looks like pudding. Or slime. People in Myanmar are used to eating a hearty breakfast soup called mohinga. It's bursting with flavor. It has ginger, fish paste, lime juice, chili pepper, cilantro, and onions. The soup's made with catfish and even has noodles in it. Salty, sweet, spicy, and sour, all at the same time. If there was a contest for the biggest breakfast in the world, the Irish would take the grand prize. Just think, a traditional Irish breakfast has bacon, white pudding, black pudding, hash browns, fried eggs or scrambled eggs, a couple of sausages, beans, and probably some fried liver. Already figured out how to burn up all those calories? Have you ever seen a skyscraper that can change its shape? The creators of the FNF Tower in Panama City had a concept and only $50 million, which isn't a lot in skyscraper money. So they couldn't afford a mistake, and they finished a concrete structure with the 39 upper floors rotating 9 degrees around an axis from the first attempt without spending any extra time or materials. Dubai's rotating tower will look different every time you see it once it's finished. Each of its 80 floors will rotate 360 degrees individually around the center of the building. The lucky residents will be able to control that rotation, which means they can choose their view from the window. A complete lap should take about 90 minutes. And no, the tower won't be a huge waste of electricity. It will produce its own energy. Wind turbines between the floors will drive the rotations. If you've ever wanted to live inside a video game, book an apartment in the King Power Mahana Khan building. This pixelated skyscraper around the height of the Eiffel Tower is the tallest building in Thailand. The secret behind its looks is the horizontally and vertically divided glass windows. It took five years to finish this beauty with over 200 apartments, a hotel, luxury shops, restaurants, and one of the most breathtaking viewpoints in the world. The Libyan International Building features one of the world's tallest artificial waterfalls running right down its side. No worries, they only turn it on on special occasions, and it uses a mix of recycled tap water and rainwater. When it started running for the first time, the non-informed locals even reported a huge water leak. The Cyber Texture Office Building in Mumbai looks like a huge egg made of glass and steel. It was actually inspired by a vessel that, like our planet, has its own ecosystem. To bring down the heat levels inside, the architects chose the ideal orientation and added sun shading and an underground cooling system. The Marina Bay Sands in Singapore seems like a Stonehenge look-alike, but its architect claims that he was inspired by a house of cards. The horizontal one is balanced on the three vertical ones. They are three 55-story hotels with restaurants, nightclubs, gardens, shops, museums, and movie theaters. The horizontal card is an infinity swimming pool with the best view of the city for up to 4,000 visitors. The pool hangs at the height of the 57th floor, and it feels like nothing is holding it. The dancing house definitely stands out among the more traditional architecture in Prague. The nickname for the house is Fred and Ginger. The stone tower symbolizes the famous dancer Fred Astaire, and the glass tower, his partner, Ginger Rogers. There's even imaginary hair on top of Fred's tower. 99 concrete panels support the dancing shape, all of them of different dimensions. Umeda Sky Building, twice the height of Big Ben, consists of two towers of glass and steel to the north of Osaka Station. The floating garden observatory connects the towers on top. Although the building is in a huge city, the skywalk is so high in the clouds that the only thing you'll hear up there is the wind. If you're scared of heights, 
you can visit an urban garden, a theater, an art museum, or one of the many offices closer to the ground inside the building. Architect Octavio Mendoza owns probably the largest piece of pottery in the world. If you're ever in Colombia, ask the locals for directions to the Flintstone House. Yes, they call it that for a reason. The official name is Casa Terracotta, and the architect only used clay to build it. He let it bake and harden in the sun, which transformed the pliable material into solid ceramic. Every curve of the building is designed after the surrounding hills. All the furniture inside is also made of clay. Mendoza is determined to work on the casa for the rest of his life. Artists Dennis Sullivan and Francis Conklin have been saving money for 15 years, carving smaller wooden dogs to create their dream project. The Dog Bark Park Inn in Cottonwood is a 12-foot beagle that stands proud in the Idaho prairie. There is a bedroom and a living area in its body and an extra bedroom in the head. Have you ever wondered what it's like to be inside a huge carpet? Eh, me neither. But checking out the Azerbaijan National Carpet Museum is definitely worth it anyway. It shows the history of this important local craft in every detail. Austrian architect Franz Jans designed the construction, and it took six years to finish it. The basket building in Ohio looks exactly like a real shopping basket, except it's 160 times larger. It even has two attached handles. The building served as the headquarters of Longaberger Basket Company, then was sold to become a luxury hotel. A giant whale? An airship? Can you guess what's inside this building in Graz, Austria? Two British architects won the Europe-wide competition to design this art museum. The biomorphic construction has around 1,000 acrylic glass elements on its skin. During the night, it can send light signals and messages to people on the other side of the river. It takes in daylight from the north through nozzles on its top. The needle is a viewing platform. The Half House in Toronto, Canada was built in the late 19th century and was one of six identical houses standing next to each other. When developers came to this area, the owners of all the other houses agreed to move. And this one wouldn't go. A demolition crew showed some impressive skills as they managed to tear down the neighboring house without doing any damage at all to what is now the half house. The white exterior wall used to be load-bearing, dividing the neighbors' bedrooms and living rooms. One wrong move of the excavator and the entire construction would become ruins. The shell house in Isla Mujeres, Mexico, stands by the ocean, was inspired by the ocean, and looks like one of the ocean's symbols. The house is shell-shaped and covered with shells from nearby beaches. Architect Eduardo Ocampo designed this beauty as he wanted to have a one-of-a-kind house for his brother to come and visit more often. Now it's up for rent for vacationers. The Bubble Palace, not far away from Cannes in France, was designed by a Hungarian architect and purchased by Pierre Cardin. In case you have a couple of spare million, you can buy this interesting property. You'll get 10 bedroom suites decorated by contemporary artists, gardens, water ponds, a swimming pool, and a 500 seat outdoor auditorium with an awesome view of the Bay of Khan as a bonus. Can you find one house standing straight here? I know, I also failed. All the cubes in the cube house in Rotterdam are tilted 45 degrees at their side. The idea here was to make the most of the space. Dutch architect Piet Blom designed the houses in the late 70s to look like an abstract forest. Each triangular roof represents a treetop. The houses stand at three floors tall with an entrance on the ground floor, an open kitchen, and a living room on the first floor, as well as a bathroom with two bedrooms on the top floor. The Boot in Tasman, New Zealand is a hotel that looks like it comes straight out of a children's book. It even has legit shoelaces. There's a spiral staircase, cozy fireplace, kitchenette, and a bedroom with a balcony. If you ever find yourself in Mitchell, South Dakota, be sure not to miss out on their key tourist attraction, the Corn Palace. The locals have always been so proud of prairie gold 
that they first built a palace out of corn back in 1892 to prove to the rest of the world how fertile their lands are. What you can see now is the rebuilt version. Every year, they put new corn in 13 shades to form new beautiful murals. Well, looky here. It's New York City, the Big Apple, the city that never sleeps, Hong Kong on the Hudson, the greatest city in the world, New York, New York, the city so nice they named it twice. All right, I'll stop. You thought you knew this city so well, but underneath all that glitz and glamour is a facade, literally. New York is populated with some of the most iconic urban buildings in the world and home to some of the most unique and famous towers. Who would have known that New York was a front for fake buildings? And the cool thing is that there are plenty to search for. Okay, I'm adding that to my bucket list. So the question is, why do they put these fake buildings all over New York? The city is one of the most vibrant places in the world and requires many infrastructures to keep the city in motion. That means having many industrial structures and buildings in every major district. New York is charming for the design and the buildings. Imagine having industrial structures right next to your favorite pizza parlor or hot dog stand. The designers thought ahead and decided to disguise those industrial infrastructures as fake buildings. They blend with the city so well that they don't stand out. They look like your good old apartment or housing unit with a front door, real-life windows, and even charming balconies where people would hang out. The only thing is that there's nothing behind the facade and no one is allowed inside. So where in the world can you find these fake buildings? For starters, one of the most popular fake buildings is in Brooklyn. At 58 Giralamon Street, you can find a very typical neighborhood. But between the buildings stands a brick building with a slightly deeper shade than the rest. It has bright open windows that blend in with the rest of the buildings in the neighborhood, except that they're blacked out. At first glance, you might not think of it as anything. But if you pay close attention, the building looks like a glitch from a video game. It was built in 1847, way before New York was considered glamorous. Originally, it was meant to be a regular building, but in 1908, they converted it into a fake building. Don't think you can just try to break in. Even if you could, it's pointless, because it's part of a ventilation fan for the subway. It also serves as an emergency exit for some of the surrounding buildings. Actually, throughout New York, many fake buildings exist to disguise the subway vents for the smoke to escape. All the way to 415 Bruckner Boulevard, the Bronx, this townhouse was designed by the Switzer Group, which is an interior architect company. It's not as charming as the one at 58 Jorah Lemon Street, but it serves a similar purpose – to hide an electric substation for New York's utility company. The city needs these substations to reduce the high-voltage electricity to a lower voltage so it can be distributed locally. Having a building like this popping out of the middle of your neighborhood isn't exactly the smartest way to attract people to the Bronx. That's why the fake townhouse facade is the perfect camouflage. Now, some of these fake buildings don't really hit the mark and stick out like a sore thumb. The people of Manhattan describe the Mulry Square infrastructure as a complete clunker. After plenty of redesigns and back to the drawing board meetings, the result is still not pretty. The locals compare it to a concrete box. They created windows without glass, which doesn't allow the building to blend in with the rest of the neighborhood. But it beats a typical subway ventilation plant either way. There are just so many places to visit and cross off your bucket list. But if you live in China, you can literally stay in the country and visit many iconic cities around the world. The replica cities began when the Chinese economy started booming in the early 90s. They wanted the lifestyle of the rich and famous without wanting to leave their country. They can be comfortable eating their local food and get the feeling of being abroad. The Chinese province of Guangdong has an identical copy of the historical Australian alpine village Hallstatt. The real Hallstatt is centuries old and one of the most charming places to discover. The local people of Hallstatt also had no idea that their home was being built in China. Some people thought that this was controversial, probably because it cost around $940 million to build it. Paris is undoubtedly one of the most charming cities you could ever visit. 
Its rich history and vibrant culture are enough to catch the first plane to go there. For residents of Tian Du Cheng, that's something they can do anytime they want. The city is also known as Sky City and has a replica of the Eiffel Tower that looks eerily like the iconic one in Paris and built buildings to match the city's visual charm. One of the main things that will break the charm is the farmland surrounding the city. There's barely anyone there, and the streets are always empty, very un-Paris-like. Still, you can find some nice fountains and statues scattered along the streets to give it some spirit. There's laundry hung everywhere, even on the trees. The picturesque fountains are dry and many apartments are empty. Only a few stores are open for business. Even though this looks like a fake city, it's quite real. Some people live here because it's more affordable than other places. Two hours away from this town is another version of Paris's Pont Alexandre III and a carbon copy of London's Tower Bridge, but with four towers instead of two. Hey, such a bargain! You can also visit the closest thing to Italy, but this time you can go shopping. Florentia Village is an outlet mall that offers an array of shops to lose yourself. The good thing is that this was built by an Italian developer to capture the essence of an Italian village. It has fountains, canals, and mosaics for proper aesthetics. It began in 2011 and has more than 200 shops with many Italian brands and British, US, and Chinese brands as well. The place is so popular that it gets between 10,000 and 25,000 visitors per day. China also has other replica towns that put you in a mini Manhattan called the Yuzhipu Financial District. The developer's goal was to make this place the financial center of the world. It was complete with the right landmarks, like the Rockefeller and Lincoln Centers, but the project was halted in 2019, leaving it mainly empty. You can find a typical English town with cobbled streets, Victorian homes, and restaurants that make Thames Town. This place was meant to recreate a European lifestyle fantasy without leaving Shanghai. China also has a Dutch town that has some elements of Amsterdam with windmills and famous canals. They even decided to copy some of the landmarks, like the Netherlands Maritime Museum. Here's a bonus story of Lebanon's thinnest building built out of a dispute. It's the story of two brothers who both inherited unequal plots of land. One of the brothers happened to get a very thin plot of land and couldn't help but be jealous of his brother's nice plot of land. He wasn't pleased. Both of the lands overlook the Mediterranean Sea in a lively neighborhood of Beirut. So it's no wonder that both brothers couldn't agree on how they should develop their lands. It was obvious that the brother with the most land could build a proper building. The other brother had to improvise. He decided to obstruct his brother's property by constructing a thin building enough to only fit 14 feet at its widest and 2 feet at its most narrow. It was constructed in 1954, and the locals of the area know it as the Grudge. The crazy thing is that the place was once habitable with many visitors enjoying their stay. It's not easy to live there, but it's part of living the experience. The building is still standing, but is empty. You've just reached your perfect spot on a deserted beach. It's so quiet here that you start to doze off. But as you open your eyes, you are shocked. Wait a minute, is that an actual house that's just been washed up on the shore? It may sound like the beginning of a sci-fi novel, but not if you live near this beach in El Salvador. There's a mysteriously abandoned house there that looks as if it's just been washed ashore. How did this villa end up there? How long has it been here without anyone noticing it? This mysterious construction is 46 miles south of El Salvador's capital, San Salvador. Locals say the building used to be a hotel called Puerto Ventura. At the time it was built, its main attraction was the fact that it was really close to the sea. Unfortunately, the engineering behind it wasn't well planned out. All because locals didn't need any official permission to start the construction. The hotel was too close to the water and dangerously exposed to the elements. The Roman-style villa is now a mere 50 feet from the edge of the sea when the tide is low. It can only be accessed in the morning because later, the tides fill the first floor with salt water. What's now left of the hotel looks like the ruins of a two-story house. The front part is very impressive with Roman-type pillars. 
It also has wide windows on the second floor. You can still see parts of the iron structures and remains of what used to be the gateway to the second floor. There are some bleachers at the top of the building. They are sometimes used by tourists. More and more people are now browsing the area, taking photos, even though the building is obviously not safe for climbing. There's little information on how long it's been sitting in its current location, but some locals say it's been there for at least 20 years. It had remained a local secret for years before it was discovered by a TikTok user in 2021. But that doesn't answer the question, how did the hotel end up in another location altogether? This is where things become a little fuzzy. While some locals say that the building was abandoned decades ago, others claim it was deserted after Hurricane Mitch hit the area back in 1998. Hurricane Mitch was one of the most dangerous weather phenomena to ever hit Central America. During the storm, the winds traveled at 178 miles per hour, and the hurricane itself lasted for about 15 hours. It was also the cause of a huge amount of rainfall, which resulted in floods and many dangerous landslides. Being built so close to the shoreline, the former hotel had little chance of surviving the extreme weather conditions. So, it must have been literally displaced. After sitting under the sun, you might start dreaming of some snowballs getting washed ashore. You know, to even out the temperature. I'm not kidding. This strange natural phenomenon did happen back in 2016. It resulted in about 11 miles of the coast of the Gulf of Ob in West Siberia getting covered with huge snowballs. Because of the low temperatures, small pieces of ice started to form in the water. Afterward, the wind and waves rolled them into giant snowballs. Some of them were the size of a tennis ball, but others were up to three feet wide. A 2004 Harley-Davidson night train motorcycle popped up ashore on a British Columbia beach back in 2012. It was neatly packed inside a shipping container. It took some time to do it, but the owner was eventually traced down. His name was Ikuyo Yokoyama, and he lost his motorcycle after a tsunami struck Japan on March 11, 2011. To get to its final destination, the Harley-Davidson traveled more than 4,000 miles. To celebrate its long journey, Yokoyama donated the bike to the Harley-Davidson Museum in Milwaukee. It's been on display there ever since, in case you want to visit. This strange phenomenon made it look as if someone spilled dish soap all over the beach. But it does happen pretty often in Queensland. Sea foam covers the shore there a couple of times each year. It mostly happens after a storm, when ocean waves move dissolved organic matter around. It's basically like a giant ice cream maker. After Cyclone Debbie back in March of 2017, some beaches actually needed to be closed because of huge amounts of white foam. The wind even brought some of that foam to the nearby towns, making locals believe it was snowing. Would you be surprised to see a 6 by 6 foot rusty metal die washed ashore on your local beach? Because back in 2017, people in Coeur d'Alene in Idaho sure were. It turned out to be an old storage tank. Someone decided to spice it up a bit by adding some white spots to make it look like a die. In 1992, thousands of rubber duckies got stranded at sea after a large container ship that was transporting them was hit by a wave. As you can imagine, the ducks started popping up all over the world, in Hawaii, Alaska, South America, Australia, in Europe, and even in the Arctic. It's estimated that a couple hundred of those unlucky rubber ducks are still out there. Interestingly, they turned out to be very useful to scientists. Based on their movements, researchers can monitor the direction of water currents. If you happen to like dinosaurs, you'll be happy to know seawaters can also bring ashore some fossils. In 2018, a large dinosaur jawbone ended up on the coast of Lilstock Beach in Somerset, England. It used to belong to a dinosaur called Ichthyosaurus. Thanks to this finding, scientists were able to make an impressive discovery. Before, they thought the Ichthyosaurus could reach a maximum length of about 69 feet. But after they studied the jawbone, they ended up recalculating the creature's size. They concluded that the Ichthyosaurus could grow up to 85 feet. The Megalodon was the largest predator in our planet's history. It lived almost all over the globe, except near the poles. How do we know that? 
because megalodon teeth keep appearing on beaches every now and then. One staggering megalodon tooth, which was way over 20 inches long, was discovered in a river in Croatia. Since these creatures have been extinct for about 3 million years, their teeth are highly prized by fossil hunters. A giant Lego man that washed ashore is something I never thought I'd hear about. And it turns out, it didn't happen just once. There were four of these giant Lego men in total, each around 8 feet tall. One was found in England and one in the Netherlands, while the other two popped up in Florida and California. It was surely not a coincidence, and after some research, people found out that a Dutch artist was behind this. Ego Leonard started this project as a personal statement campaign. A short film was even made about this, and it was called No Real Than You Are. This sentence was written on each of the four Lego men put to sea. A bundle of over 50 letters was washed ashore in New Jersey on a beach in Atlantic Highlands back in 2012. It happened shortly after Hurricane Sandy had struck the area. A 14-year-old boy found the letters and gave them to his mom. She was so touched by them that she decided to carefully dry and return them to their owner. The letters were the correspondence of two people named Dorothy and Lynn. They were dated between 1942 and 1948. The last was written a week before their wedding. With the help of an online genealogy site, the woman reached Dorothy and returned the letters to the 88-year-old woman who was living in a retirement home. Behind those huge steel doors is one of the most guarded places on Earth. It's known as Site R, or the Raven Rock Mountain Complex. You'll find it in Pennsylvania. The construction is 60 stories underground. It is said to be a safe place for people in case of a natural or human-made disaster. There's not a lot of information online about this mysterious place, but what we do know is that it's equipped with 38 communication systems. It's obviously not available for visits via Google Earth, but you can catch a quick glance at the two gates that face the complex. Vatican City is one of the most famous enclaves on Earth, and it's certainly worth a visit due to its wonderful architecture and vast list of art pieces to check out. One place, however, will always be off limits for visitors, the Vatican Secret Archives. They have some of the oldest and rarest books on Earth. These archives are available only to a limited number of people, and since they have been visited by a small number of people so far, they also trigger a lot of weird theories. For example, that there may be books proving there's life outside our planet. If you're fascinated by shipwrecks, you'll be interested to know that one of the largest wrecks you can see on Google Earth is on North Sentinel Island, India. It used to be called the SS Jassim. It was a Bolivian ferry that sank in the area back in 2003. The reason why people can't visit it physically isn't because of the ship itself, but because the island is home to the world's most dangerous tribe. We don't really know how many people live there, but it was estimated that between 50 to 400 people call this place home, and they really don't like tourists. No person that tried to reach them survived. Also, to protect them, their privacy, and their special status, the island is closely monitored by the Indian authorities. That's mostly because it's believed the locals don't have any immunity to modern diseases. So being in contact with foreigners might be dangerous for the tribe's people, since they've never seen the outer world. A huge pink bunny appeared seemingly out of nowhere in the Italian Coletto Fava Mountains back in 2005. Besides the locals, some people stumbled upon it online too. They were puzzled by the discovery. Unfortunately, that 200-foot tall bunny is completely gone today. You can still find the images of it online though. The unusual object was designed by artists from Vienna. They encouraged tourists to climb, jump, or even take a nap on top of the large rabbit. The whole purpose of the project was to allow people to experience what it would be like to live as smaller creatures. The bunny didn't have any removal date at the time it was placed there and was expected to last at least until 2025. But Mother Nature had other plans. A Japanese artist decided to move back to her little home village named Nagoro. But she soon found out that most of her neighbors were moving to bigger cities. To deal with loneliness, she started putting together scarecrow-like dolls, or kakashi, and placing them all over her garden. She didn't stop there, though. The artist soon began doing the same with many other places in her village, creating dolls and placing them as if they were taking part in various human activities. These dolls keep moving around too, but the woman likes to stay true to her story and insists she doesn't touch them. 
you can see the images of this quirky village on Google Maps. This weird portal was discovered via online maps in New Baltimore, New York. It gave people all sorts of bad dreams. With spooky-looking buildings and all sorts of blurry figures, this area soon became a source for many weird internet theories. Turns out it was nothing more than a technical issue, which resulted in those images being rendered in a distorted manner. Either way, if you look for these images on Google, you won't be able to unsee them. This cute miniature world map was created by an artist from Denmark. He continuously worked on this tedious project from 1944 until 1967, using mostly his hands and just a few tools for moving heavy rocks around. He gathered stones at the edge of the water, then recreated the map of the world on the surface of this lake. During the winter, he was able to use a sled to transport larger pieces of rock over the ice and then place them in the perfect position. Apart from the continents themselves, the map also features rivers and lakes, as well as some other famous landmarks. Care to have a look at a sea without any coasts? Search for the Sargasso Sea. You'll find it in the northern Atlantic Ocean. This weird sea is surrounded by four ocean currents and no dry land at all. It got its name from the seaweed that grows there, Sargasso. Fingerprints on the lens of a satellite camera? You may be tricked into thinking this if you search for the finger maze. It's located in the city of Brighton, UK, and is a large fingerprint created in Hove Park. It also has a maze at the center. It can be really hard and time-consuming to look for wild animals on Google Earth, but the Geo Browser does have a nice feature that can help if you're eager to see hippos and flamingos in their natural habitat. Try Googling animals from above and start scrolling through these images. This unique feature can take you from Kenya to Namibia and even all the way to Antarctica, where you can see emperor penguins. There are some places on Google Maps that, for specific reasons, aren't available for the online public, like the Royal Palace in Amsterdam. If you head over there via Google Earth, you'll see that everything around the Dutch Royal Palace is still visible, like the vegetation and roads, but the construction itself is blurred from all angles. That's probably because local authorities want to keep the unique views of the palace for the eyes of physical visitors only. The same goes for the Tantaco National Park in Chile. This one is a privately owned nature reserve that can only be seen on Google Maps from a distance. Once you reach a certain point, the zoom feature stops working. Some people say that since it's a nature preserve, it may be home to some endangered species and extreme measures are taken for their protection. You know how a certain brand of fried chicken has a certain kernel on their logo? Yeah, you won't see any of these logos in high resolution on Google Maps. That's because the online map uses specific algorithms to detect people's faces and blur them out. As you can see, it's not always really that accurate. It's called Snake Island, and the Brazilian authorities prohibit people from visiting it. For good reason. You'll find the island near the city of Sao Paulo in Brazil. It's said to be home to over 4,000 snakes. Some of the most venomous types of reptiles on Earth call this place home. If that's not creepy enough, how about that some of them are so dangerous that a small drop of their venom can permanently damage the human skin? You can see the shape of the island on Google Earth, but the more you zoom in, the blurrier it becomes. Here's another cool thing you can do on Google Earth. Time travel. Well, at least sort of. You won't be able to travel back in time and tell yourself to study more for that tricky exam. But you can see certain historical images of places you like. You can check if this feature works by looking at the upper left corner of the screen. If you can see a small icon with a clock, it may allow you to scroll some years back. But you can also see how sunlight affects Earth if you turn on the sunlight feature. Welcome to No, a small town located in the south of Seward Peninsula on the west coast of Alaska. If you live here, I'll bet you say there's no place like No. Well, maybe not. It's cold and snowy here, and no roads connect this town with other settlements. And with the onset of night, locals have disappeared here without a trace. Perhaps that's why only 3,500 people live here. Well, let's investigate this case. People disappear in cities for assorted reasons, but it was Nome who attracted the attention of the public. From 1960 to 2004, some 24 people went missing there. That number is statistically too big for such a small population. 
People just didn't come home in the morning, and no one knew what had happened to them. All the locals in small towns like Nome know each other. There are almost no strangers here, as it's difficult to get to Nome. There are no roads and no ferry crossing. All roads from Nome break off and lead to beautiful natural landscapes unspoiled by human mammals. You can get there and back by plane. And this is not some passenger jet, but a small biplane. Another way to get there is by snowmobile. By the way, Nome is the ultimate point of the famous dog sled race, the Iditarod. Also, you can pay locals from neighboring villages and towns to bring you to Nome by motorboat. But despite this, the town has become quite famous. The frequent disappearance of people finally got needed attention. The whole world found out about Nome, and in 2009, Hollywood even made a movie about it. For a long time, no one could solve the mystery. The police had no clues, no witnesses, nothing. There are long, cold nights here in winter, and the air becomes so cold that a glass of water freezes in minutes. Snow can fall constantly. Therefore, if someone leaves the town at night, snow will sweep all traces away by the morning. Of course, people began to come up with their own theories. The most popular one was about someone who took people away by force. The police didn't find any evidence that some person could do it. So, if it's not a human, it could be some beast. And again, police found no evidence to support this version. After that, people started thinking that creatures from other planets caused these disappearances. Many locals were sure that the town was a popular destination for extraterrestrial spaceships. The plot of the Hollywood movie The Fourth Kind was based on this version. More time passed. Finally, the police and the FBI launched a large-scale investigation, and they uncovered the truth. They realized that the stories about missing people were exaggerated. The popularity of Gnome and the constant talk about fantastic things made people believe in the reality of these versions. Now, let's assume that some of the appearances were made up. But still, many people are gone. What about them? The answer is bars and harsh weather. Entertainment venues are open at night. Some locals have fun, leave the bar, and go home. At this moment, a heavy snowstorm begins. Visibility drops to zero, and the strong wind knocks you down. This way, a person might simply get lost. And that's it. The truth turned out stranger than most versions. The Bermuda Triangle is a big area in the Atlantic Ocean, so the disappearance of ships and planes there seems not so surprising. But it's much creepier when it happens on a lake. Let's visit the Lake Michigan Triangle. It's located between Michigan and Wisconsin. For a couple of centuries, terrible things have been happening here. People put the same legends around this place as around the Bermuda Triangle. They reported unexplained phenomena and saw flying objects above the lake surface. Some believe that the triangle is a time portal. Of course, no theories have been confirmed, but strange cases have occurred on the triangle territory. One happened in 1950, when a Northwest Airlines plane with 108 passengers disappeared without a trace during a flight over the lake. Police officers saw a red light over the lake two hours after the plane's last communication. The aircraft probably crashed, but rescuers didn't find any passengers or wreckage. All that's left was just an oil stain on the water. Many ships and boats disappeared there. But one of the strangest cases occurred on April 28, 1937. It was midnight. One ship was sailing through this lake. Captain George Donner went to sleep in his cabin after a hard day's work. Three hours later, the vessel was approaching the port. One of the crew members went to the captain's cabin to wake him up. The door was locked from the inside. The assistant knocked, but no one answered. When he suspected that something had happened to the captain, the assistant unlocked the door. He got into the cabin, but there was no captain there. He seemed to have disappeared into thin air. The crew couldn't find him. Since then, the eerie disappearance of Captain George Donner remains unexplained. Meet David Polides. In 2008, he finished his career as a police officer and began to study the mysterious disappearance of people in Europe, the USA, and Canada. 
he found out that most people went missing in the U.S. national parks. Over the past 150 years, more than 1,100 tourists have vanished there. Many of them were experienced travelers who knew how to survive in harsh wild conditions. David has written about these mysterious vanishings. He pointed out that some of them didn't disappear, but were found alive. They woke up somewhere in the forest and didn't remember what had happened to them. The creepy detail of all these cases is that most missing persons were young. Another detail is that many went missing before hurricanes. There are too many riddles and not enough answers in this case. Then there's the Sargasso Sea in the northern part of the Atlantic Ocean. This is the only sea that doesn't have shores on land. It's called the sea only because it's defined by ocean currents. Also, golden brown algae grow in this area's bottom, making it seem like an orange spot in the middle of the endless ocean. The Sargasso Sea became famous because, in the 19th century, one of the most famous phantom ships in history sailed here. In 1872, a brigantine sailed through the Sargasso Sea. Its captain spotted another ship a few miles away. He lit a signal fire, but received no response. Then the captain decided to sail closer to find out what had happened. On the hull of the mysterious ship was the name Mary Celeste. The captain of the brigantine and several crew members went on board. They walked around the deck and looked into the cabins and the hold. Everything was in place, but there were no people. The cargo and barrels remained untouched, so pirates didn't attack the vessel. The only damaged thing on the ship were the sails. They were torn to shreds. All documents except the logbook were missing from the navigator's cabin. The last logbook entry was added on November 24, 1872. The crew of the ship was never found, and this was one of many cases. In the 20th century, from the 60s to the 80s, there were many reports of empty boats and yachts floating on the sea. Also, some entire ships disappeared without a trace. All these cases still remain a mystery. According to one version, the four-sided current forms water funnels. Whirlpools can quickly pull a ship into the depths of the sea. This explains the disappearance of boats. But what about cases when the vessel is still on the water without a crew? Sometimes these whirlpools can create wind vortices. They're like little tornadoes. What if these whirlwinds are powerful enough to throw people overboard and tear the sails? Yeah, the theory seems too fantastic. So, what do you think happened? They used to call this island the Paris of the East, mostly because it had beautiful buildings with large gardens and impressive stone archways. But now, it's nothing like it used to be, with all the architecture almost entirely covered in tree roots and vines. Ross Island is a small territory in the Indian Ocean. It's located east of the Indian city of Port Blair. Though initially thought of as a jail, Ross Island eventually became a luxurious resort for the local administrators. They called this island a real treat for its more privileged residents. It boasted opulent bungalows, stained glass window panels brought all the way from Italy, neatly kept gardens, tennis courts, and even swimming pools. Soon after the complex was closed in 1937, a powerful earthquake hit the island. It caused a lot of damage, making it even more uninhabitable. The island is now in the administration of India and has become a tourist attraction for people interested in abandoned towns. Pieces of German architecture still lie hidden in the Namibian desert. The city of Kolmanskop, Namibia, was a luxury location at its peak in the early 1900s when German workers settled here looking for diamonds. This abandoned town used to have everything from a ballroom to a hospital and even a bowling alley. It all started to decline somewhere in the late 1910s when another diamond-packed location was found nearby. So most of the people living here moved, leaving everything behind in search of more money. Kolmanskop has since been slowly occupied by sand dunes, while the hot temperature and low moisture helped to preserve the buildings. This ghost town is also available for visitors. If it sounds interesting, you can book a tour in the nearby town of Luderitz. Another abandoned castle dominates the view in Krakow, a city in Italy. 
the whole village sits atop a cliff that's 1,312 feet high. The founders liked this location since they knew it would be easy to defend themselves from unwanted guests. But the castle, built in the 1300s, soon became overwhelmed by landslides and earthquakes. Even though it has no residents anymore, the medieval city often comes alive during the various local festivals that take place here in the summer months. The locals also offer tours and tell amazing stories about the location. One of the highlights of the tour is a statue that seemingly came out of nowhere and now lies in a body of water. Hidden away in the Montana mountains, Garnet Ghost Town tells the well-known American story of the West's Gold Rush. The town's history goes back to the 1890s when they found a lot of gold in the Nancy Hanks mine. During its glory days, Garnet had almost 1,000 residents. Even though it's in a relatively secluded location, it had saloons, hotels, stores, a school, and other features of a regular little town. In 1905, when most of the gold had already been taken away, most mines were left behind, so only a couple of hundred residents stayed in Garnet. The final straw came in 1912, when a fire damaged most of the town's buildings. So, by the 1940s, Garnet was completely abandoned. It soon became a hotspot for treasure hunters looking for furnishings and artifacts. That was until a preservation campaign started in the 1970s. It ended with the town being declared a historic district in 2010. To this day, Garnet is one of the best preserved ghost towns in the area. Hashima Island is another abandoned location that tells us that when people leave, nature takes over. This mysterious place was even featured in a James Bond movie because of its ghostly landscape. It used to be a well-known spot in Japan for undersea coal mines as it was opened in 1881. In 1959, at its peak, there were over 5,000 people living here, including mine workers and their families. As soon as the mines started going dry, sometime in 1970, people started to slowly depart the island leaving it completely abandoned in three months. Even though nobody lives there these days, there are a lot of tourists here that drop off to wander around the abandoned homes, swimming pools, stores, and factories. Another town that started with a mining company back in 1881 is Calico, California. People discovered the location was packed with silver so it soon became home to over 500 silver mines and 3,000 residents. It used to feature hotels, general stores, restaurants, and a school. There was even a local newspaper printed here called the Calico Print. But by 1986, the town had become empty. One of the former locals decided to buy it and began its restoration, making it a registered historical landmark. It even has a museum of the Old West available for tourists. One of the most interesting attractions that were rebuilt is the one mile long Calico and Odessa Railroad. It currently goes through the steep canyons and hills and even passes the old mines and buildings north of Calico. Approximately one third of the town is original, while the rest consists of newer buildings that are replicas meant to recreate the spirit of its past. If you're a fan of cars, you might have heard of Henry Ford as the famous American industrialist who founded the Ford Motor Company in 1903. But in 1927, he began working on another one of his ambitious dreams, Fordlandia. It was supposed to be a massive rubber plantation located near the Tapajos River in Brazil, since he needed a reliable source of rubber for his car tires and hoses. His vision was to design a town complete with swimming pools, a golf course, living bungalows, and even weekly square dancing sessions for the locals. This project was unfortunate to begin with, since the local rubber trees soon got infected with leaf fungus. Even though Henry Ford invested a staggering $20 million into this potential income source, the town failed to produce the needed rubber. He had nothing left to do but to sell it to Brazil in 1945, and soon it was completely abandoned. Many of its buildings are still standing but have been taken over by the surrounding nature. You can still see curious tourists wandering through it to this day. During its glory days, Hampi was the second largest city in the world. Looking at its ruins today, 
it's hard to imagine this Indian city used to be filled with temples and bazaars and that it served as an important center of the Mauryan Empire in the 14th and 15th centuries. It was destroyed in the 16th century, but it still has beautifully preserved forts and markets. It became part of the UNESCO World Heritage in 1986, aiming to protect its buildings, such as the Lotus Mahal, a stone structure that was carved to resemble a lotus flower opening to the sun. A tourist village was constructed back in 1920 along the shore of Epicuan, a salt lake about 370 miles southwest of Buenos Aires in Argentina. It was designed to provide people with a busy city life a breath of fresh air near the restorative salt waters of the nearby lake. It was soon equipped with a railroad station and ended up having a population of more than 5,000 residents. The project was also destined to fail soon enough as the unusual amount of rain at that time caused Lake Epicuan to swell. In 1985, the water took over the local dam and the town was flooded. The waters were so deep that they even reached a depth of 33 feet in 1993. They only began to recede in 2009 and left behind the remaining buildings, literally encrusted in salt. No one came back to the town except for Pablo Novak, who returned here back in 2012 and was the only resident of Villa Epicuan at the time. Have you ever wondered what's inside of a kangaroo's pouch? Maybe they're saving some snacks for later. Maybe it's for their house keys. Or perhaps they're used to their part-time job transporting people to work every day. The short answer is kangaroos use the pouch to carry their young, or joey. They need the bag because after a short gestation period of up to 36 days, the joey is born and crawls into the pouch for their continued development, where other mammals would not. Once he is born, it's the size of a jelly bean. Although he is deaf and blind, it has an acute sense of smell and finds its way into the warm and protected pouch. The joey will then attach itself to the mother to drink milk where it receives nutrients and from there it will live, grow and develop for the outside world for the next four to six months. Once the joey develops enough, it can leave the pouch and stretch its legs to adapt to the world outside. But it will still go back to feed inside the pouch for a further six to 12 months. These time frames vary depending on the types of species of kangaroos there are four different types. The red kangaroo, the largest of all the kangaroos and all terrestrial animals in Australia, is found throughout the mainland, though generally in deserts and open grasslands. Nicknamed the Big Red, it can stand as tall as six feet and weigh up to 200 pounds. The eastern grey is mainly typical of the eastern coasts. These are the second largest with a height of five feet tall and a weight of up to 180 pounds. The Antilopine kangaroo, the smallest of the four, is located in the far northern tropical regions. Their height reaches up to four feet tall and they can weigh as much as 110 pounds. And lastly, you'll find the Western Grey in the southwestern and southern areas of the continent weighing up to 120 pounds while standing up to four feet tall. Of all the different sizes, their most notable ability is to leap forward in a bouncing motion, covering vast distances. The Big Red can cover up to a staggering 30 feet in just one bounce. Although what makes the kangaroo so unique isn't uncommon in Australia. They share evolutionary traits with other classifications of macropods. Wallabies, wallaroos, quokkas, and patamelons are distant cousins of the kangaroo, with several species in each classification. They all come in many different sizes and live in the unique areas that they've adapted to throughout Australia and New Guinea. Although marsupials were once more common throughout the rest of the world, it's unclear where they originated. The old fossils of marsupials were found in North America, but it is clear that the marsupials slowly made their way down under and came through South America, across Antarctica, until finally into Australia. Of course, we're keeping in mind that this was when the continents were all still attached. Once making it to Australia, they quickly adapted without competition from the other animals. Some other mammals made it to Australia around the same time. 
the bat family, and the rodent family, it's not surprising that mites and rats had managed to make it to Australia before humans. Although Australia's climate would have been very different from what we know of it today, marsupials had adapted quickly to the changes. There has been some debate about the unique characteristics of the marsupial were better suited for the drastic changes in weather as opposed to other animals. The smaller gestation period allows their young to feed on milk a lot sooner. Marsupial milk has growth and immunity factors greater than other mammals' milk, which could be beneficial in a harsher environment, which is why marsupials are more prominent in Australia. The kangaroo has explicitly adapted over the ages. Their success in adaptation reflects on their current population of around 40 million throughout Australia, easily outnumbering the human population. Although their success is not entirely due to their unique traits, it's mainly due to the lack of predators. The dingo. The mammal migrated to Australia approximately 8,000 years ago, but their numbers are controlled around most of Australia. And then there was also the thylacine, also known as the Tasmanian tiger, which slowly disappeared from the mainland since humans arrived around 50,000 years ago and it's estimated they disappeared completely around 4,000 years ago, allowing marsupials like the kangaroo to thrive. The fascinating thing about thylacine is that it provides an excellent example of convergent evolution. It is the process where animals not closely related independently evolve similar traits. The thylacine and the gray wolf come from entirely different parts of the planet and only share a common ancestor that existed at least 160 million years ago yet they evolved similarly. Other marsupials fit the category of convergent evolution. The marsupial sugar glider, which is like the placental flying squirrel, the hopping mouse, which is like the North American kangaroo rat. There are types of marsupials and other moles. The Tasmanian devil is like the hyena and wolverine, and the wombat has resemblances to the groundhog and marmot. The possums and their cousin, the opossum in North America, has evolved to have opposable thumbs, a feature found in primates. Hedgehogs and porcupines, mammals completely unrelated to Australia, have their unique spikes, but share this similarity with the echidna. The echidna is another mammal altogether and not a marsupial. It is of the monotreme order. The echidna is one of the only two left in the monotreme mammals. Unlike other mammals, monotremes don't produce live young, but lay eggs, of which their young, or puggle, hatches just 10 days after being laid. But like all other mammals, the puggle will drink milk from their mother. A further example of convergent evolution is with the koala, which has evolved to have fingerprints, like primates. The koala has adapted through the warming of the weather in Australia. As the climate became drier, there was a distinct change in the fauna throughout the continent. Eucalyptus trees became more prominent as they more easily adapted to drier climates. Over 70% of native forestry in Australia is currently eucalyptus. The eucalyptus leaves, or gum leaves, are deficient in nutrition. They are so low in nutritional value that they shouldn't be the main diet. But the koala took advantage of this uncontested food and adapted over time. And now they only eat them, and they'll gorge themselves up to six times per day. It ensures that they need to sleep up to 20 hours each day. But although they sleep a lot, they're very safe high above the eucalyptus trees. The animal world in Australia is strange as it is diverse. But even those natives in this land have their own stories that make them even more bizarre. Indigenous Australians have stories from the dream time, telling tales of weird animals that existed. One mythological animal was the bunyip. It has been told in tales as a beast that lurked within the swamps, rivers, and lakes. Although commonly known as the bunyip, it's also referred by many different names throughout the country. Before Europeans arrived in Australia, there existed around 250 languages within the native population. Each language has a similar story of a beast that lived within the water, which would provide a valuable lesson to young children to be careful around swamps and rivers. The bunyip's various forms, scales, fur, or feathers, sizes as small as a dog and as large as a buffalo. Some are unimaginably strange in appearance, 
but others weren't too dissimilar to actual animals, like the crocodile. A precursor to how mythological creatures like the bunyip were created had likely originated from bones and fossils of existing animals. For example, in Europe, stories about dragons are argued that they probably originated from finding dinosaur fossils. Fossils are the likely foundations for the stories based around the infamous bunyip, animals from the megafauna period, which around 2.5 million years ago saw the largest of them all. This period ended about 20,000 years ago. Variations of the bunyip coincide with animals that once lived during this period. The thylosolio, also known as the marsupial lion, was a large and powerful carnivorous marsupial. The diprotodon, which resembled a giant wombat, weighed around 6,000 pounds and was 10 feet long. A further version was of a beaked bunyip covered in feathers related to the dromornithidae, a bird standing at 10 feet tall. Each of these was from a time when megafauna was more common, and humans lived among them for a short period. Although the age of megafauna in Australia has long passed, there are still animals that adapted to the changes in the drying continent, the new species introduction, and even the involvement of humans. The four kangaroos, the red eastern, the western grey, and the atilopine are still living reminders of the age of megafauna. Why is Australia so strangely empty? Why haven't we discovered so much of the ocean? Is our planet a perfect sphere? And was the Earth once more purple than green? I bet you didn't know these facts about our planet, so let's find it all out. Australia is really massive. To make it easy to understand its size, it's nearly as large as the entirety of Europe. Home to around 26 million people, Australia is among the countries with the least population per area. It's ranked only 55th for the highest population in the world, while it has the 6th largest land area. Why is so much of it empty? A good guess would be the many dangerous animals hiding behind every rock. At least this is enough for me to avoid Australia. But there's one specific reason to explain this. The dryness of Australia ensures that 85% of the population lives within 30 miles of the coast and 80% of them live along the eastern side where rainfall is more common. But although there is an overall lack of rainfall, only 20% of Australia is unlivable desert and only 40% is considered not habitable by human standards. The water consumption is actually higher than their average rainfall each year. But there is a further ancient water source hidden way below, which can support a much larger population. It's one of the largest underground freshwater resources in the world, the Great Artesian Basin. It covers a staggering 656,000 square miles, which is one-fifth the size of Australia. It holds enough water to cover the Earth under a 1.5 feet deep layer of water. Or, more usefully, it could provide enough water for thirsty Australians over the next 1,500 years. Only 6.5% of Australia has soil suitable for farming, so this doesn't seem like a huge amount. But in case you forgot, Australia is big. And this small percentage is about the size of France. With this massive area available for farming, Australia has more than enough to feed its population with a further 70% of agriculture products that are exported overseas. So, with plenty of land, food, and water, why are the population figures so low? A very slow migration process is the reason. First, only people from the United Kingdom lived there. Then, they opened their borders to other Europeans, and this restriction remained in place until 1973. You would think almost 200 years would be enough time for a lot of people to migrate, but Australia was just so far away. The risk of traveling such a long way and the cost of the journey meant that people from Europe prefer the shorter and cheaper options to migrate elsewhere, like Canada or the USA. For the past 2,000 years, people have understood that Earth is round. But did you know that it's not a perfect sphere? Through the wobbly rotation of Earth, our planet constantly changes its size, very slowly, of course. The North and South Poles are surprisingly flat. Earth is pretty much like a ball being squished. Imagine there's a giant hand with the fingers pressing at both poles. 
Because of this pressure, the equator pushes a little outwards. Along with an uneven gravitational field, Earth has loads of gravity glitches, some positive and others negative, creating an uneven, rocky, and bumpy surface. Some places on Earth have more gravity than others. If you weighed yourself along the equator, you would weigh 0.5% less than at the poles. Not a whole lot and definitely not worth the trip to change your weight. If you were to measure the length from the center of the Earth towards the furthest point of Earth, you would be shocked that Mount Everest isn't at the end of it. Instead, it's along the equator, which is the pushed out part. Ecuador's mountain Chimborazo would actually be the tallest point on Earth as it's the furthest from the center. We still have around 80% of the ocean to map, which is crazy considering how much of the solar system we've explored in comparison. But we're still aware of many of the unbelievable details about the ocean. It covers over 80% of the world's surface, where 94% of the Earth's wildlife lives. And from some of the life in it, up to 80% of the world's oxygen is produced mainly from plankton, algae, and bacteria. One of the most famous already mapped places is the Mariana Trench. It's the deepest point on Earth, as low as almost 7 miles deep. That's a huge, five times the length of the Grand Canyon and deeper than Mount Everest is tall. It's also home to one of the most ancient seabeds on Earth, casually laying low for about 180 million years. The pressure at the bottom is over 1,000 bars, but although this is 1,000 times more than normal pressure, life still flourishes here. Throughout the ocean, there is an estimated over 3 million shipwrecks lying in the murky depths. Countless artifacts sit there untouched, and there could be more than all the world's museums. The Mid-Ocean Ridge is the longest in the world, reaching 40,000 miles. That's almost 10 times the size of the Andes, the longest mountain range on land. The sun is the reason behind the blue and aqua colors of the ocean. This color isn't from the reflection of the sky, though they are both blue for the same reason. The surface of our planet receives white light from the sun, and it absorbs the orange, red, and yellow light stronger. It doesn't absorb the blue light so much, so it returns to how we see it. Of course, this only occurs based on how pure the water is. If the water is full of mud or algae, they scatter the light and overpower the water's natural blueness. There are many factors that determine what color we see on our planet. Could you believe that the Earth was green before? Instead, it was purple. Chlorophyll in our atmosphere absorbs mainly blue and red wavelengths from the sun, and reflects the green ones to what we see our planet as today. Long ago, ancient microbes called retinol dominated the Earth instead of chlorophyll. They absorbed green light and reflected red and violet light. Those microbes had a simpler structure, so they were easier to produce in the low oxygen environment of the early Earth. They provided our planet with a purplish color instead of green. But chlorophyll is more efficient, and as the Earth was developing, it eventually took over. Imagine that billions of years ago, faraway observers could see our home as a small purple dot. I wonder if we could have also been purple. Probably not. The biggest tree on Earth is a giant sequoia named General Sherman. It stands over 280 feet, almost reaching the height of a 26-story building. They believe it to be 2,700 years old, with a circumference of 1,000 inches. Its weight is a staggering 1,800 tons. That's heavy, but it isn't the heaviest living thing on Earth. In Utah, a huge grove of trees called Pando works like a single colony of trees. The massive root system connects all of them together with up to 47,000 stems. It weighs up to 6,000 tons and is 80,000 years old. It makes it the oldest living thing known to humans. Now, what about the biggest area of one being? Off the coast of Western Australia, a seaweed grows to an unthinkable size. The Poseidon's ribbon weed has been growing for 4,500 years, spreading underground clone shoots. It's all connected and shares the same DNA with most of its shoots. It covers a massive 77 square miles, the same size as 28,000 soccer fields or the size of Nebraska. 
And it won't stop there either, as it continues to grow by two feet each year. It's hard to even picture the scale of these enormous beings. Now, just imagine if they were all purple. Jeez, no need to swing your fists here. These savages can't even eat in mm. peace. You're walking down the street and notice a QR code right next to a parking meter. You have just parked your car, but for some reason, this QR code is grabbing all the attention. You think to yourself, hey, maybe this is how I pay for parking nowadays. You take out your phone and scan it. A link opens up and redirects you to a fishy-looking site that shows you where you have to pay and is asking you for a lot of money. There's no one around you to help, and you know for a fact this is not the price for two hours of parking. After going through the procedures, you look at your bank account and are in shock. They took a lot of your money. You call the bank to quickly freeze your account and ask them to help you get your money back. You scratch your head in confusion and look around you. Nobody seems to mind these QR codes scattered all over the city. You show them to other people in the city, and they're also surprised. QR codes stand for Quick Response Codes, since they're easy to scan and get info on something. It only takes seconds to get an insight on something or check out the menu at a restaurant. While this has been an awesome way to make our lives easier, some people are using it for the wrong reasons. Many experts warn about randomly scanning QR codes off the streets, since it may lead to scam websites where people can take your information and bank details and gain access to your credentials, just like what happened when you were trying to pay for parking. So that QR code that you scanned redirected you to a fake website where you handed out all your personal information, including banking details. The people behind this scam can now access your account and take out as much money as they want. They might even ask for more details, like your email and phone number, which you shouldn't give out unless you trust the source. You call someone to assist you for them to take down the QR code. On social media, you find out there are dozens of people who are also falling for this trick and losing their money. This is equally common for people who access public Wi-Fi hotspots. In settings like a cafe, airport, or public park, you always choose the Wi-Fi network that has the name of the place you're sitting in, like Free Wi-Fi Cafe, for example. Without thinking, you instantly connect to the router and are redirected to a page where they ask you to log in with your email, password, and other information about you. Most of the hotspots are legit, 
But some belong to people who set up this hotspot to lure everyone in to give out their personal information. Once you enter their page, the people on the other side are watching you jot down everything they ask for. They even create a page where you have to fill in extra personal information about yourself, like addresses, place of work, and so on. The best way to properly avoid this is by asking anyone who can assist you and confirming whether or not you're connected to a safe Wi-Fi network. Or, if you frequently visit the place to do some remote work, always connect to the same Wi-Fi router even though the bad one that was set up has the same password and an identical landing page. You just can't trust anything in your inbox these days, especially not the emails that claim you just won something or that someone is contacting you for a fishy business proposal. Such emails are usually presented convincingly and make you think that they're real. But the best way to spot them is to pay attention to the details of the content. Check for spelling mistakes or style of writing. If it looks like there are some mistakes or weird and unprofessional writing, this can be a red flag. Also, check if the email signature exists. Most companies have an email signature with the person's job description and credentials to verify the source. These emails contain links that can redirect you to websites where the people who sent out these emails can get all your information. You should also pay attention to the ones sending you the emails to check if they are verified and come from a legitimate source. So, if the email ends with anything other than the company's name, this can also be a red flag. Sometimes people try to pretend they're someone you know, your boss or a co-worker or even your friend. They would write to you in a very convincing manner where you would think that they're actually sending you an email. These sorts of emails may not be real. You should check for the source and the content and verify with the person who sent it to you before replying or giving out any information. The targets usually include people who have high positions in large companies and corporations. They are considered the big fish in the game. Your emails also include links in which you can give out sensitive information which they can use against you. Protecting yourself online is not easy and requires a lot of concentration and hard work. There are many techniques that can make your sensitive data end up in the wrong hands. QR codes are just one example of misusage of new technology that is supposed to make your life easier. But don't worry, this doesn't mean that all QR codes are up to no good. Just like with every new piece of technology in the market, there will always be a way for it to be used for the wrong reasons. The internet, as we know it, is entering a new phase, Web 3.0. The internet was born in the 60s, when it was meant to connect computer devices to universities across the United States. Only four were initially used, but eventually, many other universities took part in this, and it stretched to Europe. After that, it was known as the internet. We saw the first promising years of the internet during the 90s, which was known as Web 1.0. It might sound complicated, but it just means that websites were static and users couldn't interact with them. Nonetheless, everyone knew that this would be the new way of communicating and gathering information. It was only a matter of time before people could upload content on the internet. Blogs, forums, comment sections, report pages, and messaging portals made it possible for people to interact with the websites they grew to love. Web 2.0 gave rise to popularity for modern-day social media, which made it easy for people to upload their own music and videos and stay connected with friends and family from all over the world. While this was an amazing achievement, some downsides were inevitable. It's easy for anyone to dig up information about anyone publicly online. In this day and age, online privacy is basically non-existent. But the main issue with Web 2.0 is that whenever someone uploads a piece of content, it does not technically belong to the user anymore. Web 3.0 is built around blockchain technology, and this will be the new and improved internet. Blockchain is a publicly accessible domain that shows transparent transactions for any user. This means that if you upload a piece of your artwork, they will know that you are the original creator. 
nobody can claim your artwork as theirs. And this goes for anything that can be traded online. This will protect the content creator to the fullest. As of 2022, we're still in the early stages of this, and it's only going to get more interesting. Major corporations are developing metaverses, where people can transport themselves into virtual realities. In this world, you can socialize, buy stuff, and interact with the world around you. You can pick any avatar you want and wear anything you feel like. Hey, you want to dress up as an astronaut? (laughs) You can. You can go to different planets across the metaverse and meet all kinds of crazy-looking avatars. In the workplace, you can even attend different meetings with co-workers to discuss work-related stuff while physically sitting at home. Gaming will also be elevated to a brand new experience where players are immersed in a world where they can be anyone or anything. This will be the future that we will get to witness in the coming years. It's 10 p.m. You suddenly feel hungry and go to the fridge, but there's nothing inside. You decide to hop to the nearest supermarket. There, you find the snack you want and pay by card. On the way home, you wonder, was it this easy to get food in the city a century ago? One of the streetlights flickers and goes out. You are now in the dark, feeling scared. Now you know how people felt after sundown in the pre-electricity era. We are so used to power that we forget that it isn't even a century old. In 1925, only half of all US homes had electricity. Without it, nothing would be possible today. The light in your room, the refrigerator, store signs, and credit card. They all need electricity to run. So, how did people live without it? Did our cities lie in complete darkness? Not quite. The history of illuminating our homes and streets is thousands of years old. Recently, 2022, archaeologists discovered the oldest intact oil lamp. They estimated it was 2,300 years old. There is evidence of workshops that produced these lamps on a massive scale. Italian scientists have discovered similar lamps in Modena. This city was the center of oil lamp production in the Roman Empire. The workshops were so widespread that they even had different brands. Fortis, Feitasbai, and Strobili. Some brands were in high demand. So other manufacturers copied their makers' marks. And you thought that fakes were a modern problem. These oil lamps were simple in design. High-end lamps were made from bronze and other metals. But the most common material was clay. People would pour oil through the central hole and then burn a wick inside the nozzle area. The wick was mostly linen. But oil lamps were small in size and were used indoors. There was no way to light a whole street with them. The alternative was You've guessed it. Candles. Humans still use candles today. Your grandma probably has a candle and a box of matches hidden in a drawer somewhere, just in case of a power outage. Humans have been making candles for 5,000 years. When you think of a candle, you think of beeswax. But the range of candle materials is pretty wide. In the Middle Ages, only the rich could afford beeswax candles. The rest of the population had to be happy with tallow. By modern standards, candles have terrible energy efficiency. Do you remember the time when you first saw a candle and tried to touch it? Ouch! You never got that idea again, did you? Candles use a lot of energy to generate heat. That's why they are far from ideal light sources. And the light they emit is not the kind we need. It's infrared. Humans cannot see this sort of light. The numbers are staggering. Only 1% of candlelight is visible to us humans. Modern light bulbs are way more efficient. They shine 80 times brighter than candles. In such dim conditions, our ancestors had to be imaginative. For instance, they covered artwork with a thin layer of gold. This technique was called gold leaf. Artists didn't do this to make their artwork look luxurious. They wanted their paintings to glow in the candlelight. And they had another ally in the struggle against darkness, natural light. Have you ever wondered why old churches have tall, elongated windows? Their main function was to let sunlight inside. After all, these structures were huge. There was no other way to illuminate them. Just take Notre Dame, Paris, France, as an example. It covers an area four times as large as a hockey rink. And the building was 211 feet high. That's about half as tall as the Great Pyramid of Giza. So it made sense to build large windows. In homes, mirrors had the same effect as windows. 
they would reflect natural light around the house. Before electricity, our homes were packed with mirrors. And how many do we have today? One in the bathroom and maybe one in the hallway. That's because we no longer need them to reflect light. All those mirrors have been replaced with a simple flip of a light switch. Today, interior designers advise people to remove mirrors from their bedrooms for better sleep. Talk about a plot twist. But what about buildings that people visited at nighttime, such as theaters and opera houses? The solution was surprisingly low-tech. Candles. Like, thousands of them. Builders mounted them on large chandeliers. But there was a problem. All those candles created heat and would burn for an hour or so, max. Playwrights and composers had to add pauses, so staff would have time to replace the candles. Have you ever shattered a light bulb by accident? Not a pleasant experience, but luckily, you can clean the glass with a broom in seconds. Before electricity, such clumsiness cost people their lives. Knocking over a candle could start a major fire. And there was another danger. Ladies wore long dresses that presented a fire hazard. Our ancestors were literally playing with fire. And this is all indoors. Outside the house, you would have to carry a flaming torch. Or hope that the sky wasn't cloudy, so you could navigate by moonlight. And one smart American decided not to go out at night at all. Benjamin Franklin went to bed at 10 p.m. and got up at 5 a.m. But over in London, going out at night created a new business. Link boys carried torches for Victorians. These youngsters would wait outside inns for patrons to come out after dark and offer their services. And they did their job in times of thick fog as well. That's the English weather for you. Before electricity, it was dangerous to go outside after sundown. But this was about to change in 1807. That's when a German engineer, Frederick Windsor, lit a street in London using gas lamps. It was finally becoming possible to go out at night and feel safe. Now these gas lamps weren't easy to operate. At dusk, a lamplighter had to carry a torch to turn them on, so to say. And then, at dawn, they had to do another round to put out the flames. That sounds like some good cardio. And it was. During their entire career, a lamplighter could easily walk 150,000 miles in total. And then came electricity. In the 1870s, Thomas Edison was the first to produce commercial light bulbs. A city in the west of Romania, Timisoara, became the first place in Europe to have electric streetlights. Half of the homes in Britain had electric power by the end of the 1930s. The age of electricity had begun, but there was still room for improvement. At the time, the most common type of light bulb was incandescent. This means that the light bulb has a filament inside that produces light when heated by electric power. This type of bulb is similar to a candle. It produces heat rather than light, and the ratio will stun you. 95% of the electricity that flows through the light bulb is converted into heat. Yes, you've heard it right. Only 5% of energy is used for creating actual light. Despite this, electric power has changed the way we live. In the year 1800, only 2% of the world's population lived in cities. And there is a good reason for this. Cities were dark places, illuminated only by candles and oil lamps. There was no street lighting. After electricity became a thing, the numbers turned. According to the World Bank, more than half of the world's population, 56%, lives in cities today. And our urban settlements look a lot different than they did just a century and a half ago. They now shine bright on satellite images, from space, Las Vegas is the city that shines the brightest at night. But the story of illumination is far from over. In 2006, Ann Arbor, Michigan, US, became the first metropolitan area to use LED for street lighting. It is short for light-emitting diodes. This new type of lighting uses at least 75% less energy than the light bulb perfected by Edison in the 1800s. And they last longer too, up to 25 times. China's Yunnan province has a county that's situated right in the valley between two mountains and on either side of the Nanchi River. And this place stretches quite far. It's considered to be the narrowest city in the world. Yanjin County is connected by a few bridges and has many amazing colorful buildings among the riverbank. In the upper levels of the town, a bit away from the river, there are many shops and restaurants pinned side to side, both traditional and modern looking. 
you can walk along the road with the river right below you and know that you're standing in the middle of the city. Well, sort of. Technically, the middle of the city are the bridges. The county is 37 miles north to south and 25 miles east to west, including the mountains. The population is almost half a million people, and the territory is more than 770 square miles. There are two rivers that split into three parts. If you're standing on either side of the river, you'll notice how close the other side of town is. Despite the length of the city, there aren't that many bridges around. The main hub is located down by the river, which is at 1,100 feet. The highest elevation goes up to 7,200 feet. Because the city is built in such a unique way, the weather pattern is specific to the county. The summers are really hot, especially by the river, and the winters are very wet. That's all thanks to the geographical location. The town is 100 feet at its thinnest and 1,000 feet at its widest. To put that in perspective, the narrowest part is shorter than an Olympic pool, and the widest is around seven of those. The city is almost impossible to get lost in, but it even has a railway system to transport people out of town and from one end to another. It's situated slightly above the river towards the mountains and goes through a small tunnel in one of them. You can catch some amazing views while relaxing on a smooth train ride. Because the town is so narrow and real estate so limited, most of the apartment buildings are concentrated along the riverbank. You can literally dive from any balcony and swim in the river. But some of those spots aren't safe for swimming, since the river isn't smooth. The buildings have pillars in the foundation to prevent any potential river flooding in case the water levels rise. The river doesn't exactly flow in a perfectly straight line, but rather a series of jagged turns and corners. So from an aerial point of view, the whole town resembles a slithering snake. Depending where the buildings are, the first floor will sometimes be found on the fifth. The bottom four floors are just pillars supporting the building. Some buildings are quite tall, so you can get some amazing views, while others are closer to the ground. Either way, you gotta admire the creativity put into the engineering. To build a whole town in such a place isn't easy. Besides the town being charming as it is, the cultural aspect is another reason to visit this place. Once a year, the Dancing Flower Festival takes place. A group of locals dress up in traditional clothes in a special space where the dancing is. There's also the old town of Dusha. Even though most of the town adopted modern ways of living, they still keep the old traditional architecture around. This little charming spectacle is more than 2,200 years old and was an important passage linking Yunnan province and central China during the third century. The entrance to the old town combines the ancient architecture with modern designs. At the entrance of the town is the famous Old Pavilion. Walking along its roads makes you feel like you're in the ancient times. They're all rugged, yet still well-preserved since they built them centuries ago. And nearby is the mountain scenery, which has limestone peaks covered with flowers and herbs. You can get lost in a natural maze of trees and rocks. This place is an escape from the hustle and bustle of the main town, and isn't so far away either. The town has a deep history and has been populated for hundreds of years. The county was famous for its salt trade, since it's strategically one of the best routes for caravans and traders. But sadly, the economic situation isn't easy for imports today. Since there's only one access road to the town, trucks bringing in goods are always limited. It does well on tourism for foreigners and local Chinese too. The old town of Lijong is another charming town in the same province as Yanjin. The town is built on an uneven landscape, but adapted to it perfectly. In ancient times, the location served as a strategic point for trade between surrounding provinces, and even connected with the Silk Road. It was also a cultural melting pot between different ethnic groups in the region for over 800 years. So, most of the traditions and architecture are a result of all those years of trading and sharing and mixing different cultures. It's also a good location that gives access through the mountains. The rivers and springs flow down to the town through ancient canals that are still used to this day. The town is divided into the Dayan Old Town, Baisha, and Shuye. Dayan Old Town was considered to be the commercial center for Lijiang. It has amazing architecture 
that feels like you're in some kind of movie. Many of the buildings have unique tiled roofs and arched gateways, all carved with murals. This part of town still has some of its old landmarks, even today. They even preserved some of the utensils from the past. The Baisha isn't that far north of the Dayan Old Town and comprises housing units that are centuries old. The Shuye housing is located northwest of the Old Town and arranged in the mountains surrounded by lots of water. The water system is distributed very neatly and keeps the charm of the town. Here, you can find a blend of many cultures and traditions collected throughout the centuries. The old town of Lijiang is a unity between people and nature. They utilize the mountains, trees, rivers, and architecture to create a perfect harmony for living. The water originally comes from the snowy mountains and flows to the town and supplies the farms. The whole town itself is built around the water, which influenced the style, landscape, urban layout, and everything else in between. Many canals are linked to the buildings and alleyways to make sure the town doesn't go dry. Yangzhou is famous for its bamboo cruise boats for fishing and transportation. It's surrounded by broad expanses of land and mountains in the background. In these boat tours, you can have an up-close experience of the traditional village life and how they fish to sustain themselves. You can even find some unique wildlife lurking around. Besides the river, the town is located in the center of the mountains, with the river not too far away. The marketplace is buzzing with local artisans, displaying their works and art for tourists to bring home. You can find cycling trips in various places and let the cheerful atmosphere sink in. Moon Hill is famous for the amazing panoramic view of the mountain peaks and the rest of the province. You can also check out the water cave if you have an extra taste for adventure. And while you're at it, you can go climbing, kayaking, and trekking. To get an even better view of everything, you can catch a ride on a hot air balloon that'll float you to the top and immerse yourself in the beautiful landscape. You can get a view of the stone village perched on top of a hill surrounded by walls dating back centuries. The place is around 1400 years old and is also a mix between different ethnic groups adding the richness to the culture. Many locals have kept the same festivals and customs, but even though the place has deeply rooted cultural traditions, it's adapted to the modern ways of 